All right, everybody. Good evening. It's Tuesday night, a little after seven o'clock central, and it's time for our weekly conversations with Commodores. You may not recognize this man's face, but as soon as he starts talking, you will recognize his voice. Andrew Allegretta is our guest tonight. Andrew, thank you, bud, for making some time. Uh, absolutely. It's a pleasure to do it. If you want to just close your eyes, everybody, or take him off screen and just listen, that's how I normally, <laughs> a couple of days a week, I'm listening to him passionately call the black and gold games. And we sure appreciate, Andrew, all the passion you've brought since 2021 to to all the fans out there. So I know you, you've you got to be the biggest sports fan, and, and I guess we'll start there. Growing up in, in Maine, talk to us about your sports journey. Where did you get your start, your love of sport? Wow. Um, the first sporting event I ever attended was when I was five years old, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but it was the Yankees and it was the Red Sox at Fenway Park. Oh, my. Um, so that's a heck of an introduction to sports. Mm -hmm. um, hockey was really significant uh, in my upbringing. Um, a lot of AHL games, the Portland Pirates, which nobody should know that name, but Nashvilleans should know uh, one of their coaches because that coach is now the general manager of the Nashville Predators, and that's Barry Trotz. Oh, wow. So when I was, um, I guess, five or six, they won – a minor league championship and Barry Trotz was the head coach of that team. And then he went right from there to be the first head coach of the Preds. So it was all there um, very much in the family, um, very much something I liked to do. Wasn't deeply skilled at it, but I certainly had a good time with it. Uh, and, and I always just liked being around it. So um, I, I suppose my answer is not different than anybody else, but a lot of new England sports through and through. What about from a uh, being on the sidelines and, and calling the action? Did you start that, say, in high school or, or where, where did you get your first experience of uh, calling what you're seeing? So I think my mom would have a story about um, me kind of doing it when the Olympics rolled around in 1996. Mm -hmm. I, I think she's got a few stories like that where I would do it when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. I don't remember that as much. I remember being 12, 13, watching Sports Center and going, that looks fun. I'll do that, please. And then from that point forward, it was pretty much predetermined for me. Like I, I've been very lucky and fortunate in that regard. Like all of the people that we know in our lives that go into college, they go undecided, they leave college, they're still undecided, they're 30, they're undecided. They're 40. They're undecided. That's never been me. So I've been very, very fortunate in that regard. Uh, so from that moment of going, yeah, Sports Center, that looks cool. Um, it was pretty much like, let's find a school where I can do that. I can learn it. Um, and then there's all of those moments along the way where you can kind of be knocked off course mm -hmm. and you try it and you don't like it. I never had those moments. So from the first time I tried it, uh, doing some internships in high school uh, to getting on Syracuse's campus. It was always a fit. So I've been very, very fortunate in that regard. You you have been fortunate because there's so many of us that that have dreams of being the shortstop for the Atlanta Braves. And somehow those get uh, by the wayside and other things prevail. But I, I kind of enjoy what I do as well, being a lawyer. But but Andrew, you speak of going to, to Syracuse and their school is so well known. There, there is countless uh, alums who have made it in all types of broadcasting, not just sports, but the news, et cetera. And from that standpoint, how has the, the Mike Tarikos of the world been an influence on your, your path? Because to me, Tarico, at least professionally, is one of the best ever. But uh, I know. And in terms of being a human being, he's one of the best as well. I I'm not going to tell you that I'm best friends with Mike Tarico. I'm not. Mm -hmm. However, one of my best friends is great friends with Mike Tarico. So I've known him a little bit through proximity and first class. Um, the best thing about Syracuse to me, and I don't think it's dissimilar to what Coach Corbin has created with Vanderbilt baseball. The best thing about it is you are pushed through competition. You are pushed through uh, the passion of your peers. Um 
you walk in and you recognize that everybody there has the same desire and likely has a higher um, aptitude to go achieve it than you. Uh, so you can step into that environment and just go work because everybody else is and everybody around you is very, very good. Um, the quintessential and cliche, you know, rising tide lifts all boats sort of thing. Uh, and then the second part of it is I recognize, and this is kind of in the weeds of my profession, I recognize that getting started can be really difficult. And you need the ability to make a phone call or send an email or send a text and have it be returned. And just the ability to say, hi, my name is Andrew. I'm graduating from Syracuse they'll respond. And there's a huge network of people that are willing to respond because you went to Syracuse. That doesn't make any one of us any better than anything else. It's just kind of a community and a network thing. Um, so I had the ability to reach out to a few people and make some friends and just kind of have some dots come together. I don't have the world's greatest career arc in my profession. There are authors with with stunning career arcs that would just blow past mine, but I'm really happy with mine. And a lot of it is because of the ability to just reach out to the Seraph Q's family. You know, it, it's, it, this I think would, would go across any profession that it's easy to compare what our, our classmates have done. I have classmates who are on the Alabama Supreme court. I have classmates <laughs> who are uh, lead counsel for these large corporations and good for them, but I love what I do. And this is meant to be a compliment to you, but every time I listen to your broadcast, which is almost every week, multiple times a week, I hear it in the passion that you have. Obviously, I never heard you when you were at uh, VaTech or at Tulane, but since 2021, I really, and, and I'd speak for many, many others, that passion is, is there. Now, you stepped into the shoes of somebody who had been in this job for a long time and was very beloved. Rightfully so. It's, it's kind of like, you know, you're the man to replace the man. So I kind of want to tread on that kind of lightly, but how has that been for you? I know you don't have, or at least I assume you don't have prior Nashville Vanderbilt ties. You're coming into this fresh but frankly, you've put your own stamp on things. And I think that that's refreshing. So I don't know if you've, if, if there's been any uh, uh, hurdles for you or it's just part of the profession. So I'll take the first part first. Yeah, sorry, uh, sorry, long -winded. No, no, <laughs> it's fine. We're hanging out here. Um, first part first, which is where your classmates go yeah. and what you want to do in the profession. Yeah. Um, a really good friend of mine is Kevin Brown. If anybody's a Baltimore Orioles fan, he's the TV voice of Baltimore. Um, a good friend of mine is Mike Cousins, who has done a bunch of ESPN games. Um, and is kind of like the lead ESPN radio voice these days. Um, goodness. You know, uh, I've watched some guys uh, graduate after me and make it to ESPN and beyond a lot faster. Mm -hmm. I don't care. I genuinely don't um, because they're different lifestyles. Mm -hmm. And I like the lifestyle I have. Like my desire isn't just to ego maniacally make my way to the top of the broadcasting world. Like I promise it's not. Mm -hmm. I don't have some sort of end goal where I must take Joe Buck's job. Otherwise I will not be satisfied. Um, those people, that work at ESPN, have a wonderful job. Great job, really good job. Uh, but I also know that every single game that they call is a road game. And every place that they're going is through some, saw, some small regional airport. And that's fine. All of that stuff's awesome. Half of my games are at home. And I want a family. I've got a family. I want to live in a great place. I live in a great place. There's work-life balance that I can attain doing what I do that they can't. I want to be part of a community. Like uh, if you're a national sportscaster, you're not as likely to do a conversation with Commodores because you're not in that family. 
Yeah. Um, I got to know that working at Virginia Tech because they've got candidly a great community. It's a great fan base. Um, and I think I kind of knew that anyway, that I wanted that. Uh, but it, it definitely was cemented there. Um, I What's funny about the the passion thing is there's a lot of people I, at Tulane, they wouldn't have said that. Um, in part because who who I followed at Tulane, um, guy named Todd Graffanini, and he's he's now the voice of the New Orleans Pel- Pelicans. One of these like small world things where the voice of the Pelicans, Sean Kelly, left to take the ESPN radio job. Todd Graffanini fills in. I take Tulane. Tulane. A couple of years later, Mick Hubert retires from Florida. Sean Kelly is now the voice of the Gators. Whatever. Um, anyway. Todd was like a little and still is for the Pelicans bundle of explodable energy. And it's not really my style. Uh, I'm passionate about Vanderbilt, but the explodable energy is not my thing. So they thought I was dull down there. Um, I, I don't know how I, I, sometimes I struggle with articulating things and having them not seem cliche or, like he's feeding a line. Um, but for a lot of years, I was in places where I knew I at some point would want to leave. I'm not in that spot anymore. Professionally, I'm in a place where I want to stay. And I think when you're in that situation, the natural passion for the success of the place elevates. Um, it's not that I wasn't passionate about Virginia Tech succeeding or Tulane succeeding. I was, um, but I also cared a lot about the broadcast being good to make sure that I was at my best to kind of take the next step when I was ready to take the next step. Um, I don't, I mean, I care about the broadcast being good a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, but I'm also not worried as much about Like, oh, did I have a great call today so I can send that to somebody so I can go get a new job? Like that that part of it's gone. And I can get to know Coach Corbin or Coach Lee or Coach Stackhouse or Candace Lee or whatever and really become a part of this place. And it's going to take some time. I mean, I'm a year and a half into it. That's not not a lifetime. Uh, but, But it's been thoroughly engaging, entertaining, fun for me to become a part of it. So that's a very long-winded way of saying, because I'm where I want to be, because I've enjoyed getting to know the community, I think hopefully the desire for Vanderbilt to succeed comes through in the broadcast. Well, you you have perfectly responded to, to the way I have felt about your broadcasts because of the knowledge you've learned an incredible amount of information in such a short period of time. And what makes it equally, or uh, I guess increasingly difficult, and we don't have to go down these paths too much, is the transfer portal. You don't get the opportunity to now grow for the next four years with all of the guys on the various teams. (laughs) Because, For example, our basketball team has one player that we would recognize on the current roster. Now that conversation aside, and he wasn't even there two years. He wasn't even there two years ago. Right, right. And you've got a whole turnover that I mean, we just announced, or they just announced today that one of the DBs is in the in the portal. And I mean, it's a real shame, but it's that's the modern game right now. So, how much pressure does that put on you now? As we're we're about to head into a, I'll call it a lull or a dead period because we don't have spring ball anymore, and we've got about four months until the first five months till the first game but there could be more roster turnover. I don't think it puts pressure on me for what it's worth. I think that's pressure on coach Lee Stackhouse and Corbin (laughs) or Candace Lee uh, or everybody over at the anchor impact fund. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's not pressure on me. I get disappointed. um, Not in the sense that name image likeness is doing its thing or whatever, Mm-hmm. Um, I just want Vanderbilt to succeed and having as many good players as possible helps that. Um, so from that perspective, it's disappointing, mm-hmm. but I don't feel pressure. Um, and by the way, I don't mean to sidestep the 
Joe Fisher question. Sure. Um, sure. I kind of went one direction and it just happened. Um, Joe is awesome. Mm -hmm. One of the first people I met with when I got the job was Joe. Like we had coffee in Bellevue. He's awesome. He's great. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I felt pressure replacing Joe in the sense of like, oh my goodness, can I match Joe? Yeah. Like I'm 34, which doesn't make me old, but it makes me someone that's been around long enough to have a sense of self. Mm -hmm. um, Joe is Joe Fisher and Andrew's Andrew. Yeah. That's all I knew how to do. Um, but I also respect the fact a million percent that all of those moments, I'm at Hawkins, like the worth Scott home run is Joe Fisher's voice. Like I've heard the story of Charlie Hawkins taking that call over to Tim and Maggie and saying, this is the greatest thing ever. Listen to Joe call the Worth Scott home run. Mm -hmm. My voice isn't going to be on those moments. Hopefully my voice will be on some other moments down the road. Um, so he's awesome. He's fantastic. He's a great person. And he was a first class ambassador of Vanderbilt athletics for 20 plus years. So okay. I'm not trying to replace Joe or anything. It's just I'm trying yeah. to call. I'm just trying to call my games. No, your 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 perspective is is fantastic, Andrew. There's you're not you're not replacing Joe. You're being Andrew, and your style is different. I mean, all I would assume that all play by play announcers uh, styles are going to be different. And if they weren't, if they weren't unique to you, then you wouldn't be authentic. And yeah. the the um, knowledgeable fan would figure that out pretty quickly. And that's what I appreciate what you bring is your authenticity. Now, along those lines, I know we only have a short sample size. Do you have any favorite calls, any favorite moments or games thus far uh, on campus or, or calling any Vanderbilt sports? Uh, the two no hitters are special. I think as someone that calls a lot of baseball games, mm -hmm. uh, those are rare. Um, I mean, coach Corbin has had, what is it five or six now? I think it's five. I think it's five. <clears throat> yeah. It's five. No hitters in 20 is, years. <laughs> is, it, is it four in the last five seasons or something? And four, like yeah. And it's four in the last four full seasons. If you take away 2020, cause that doesn't count. Right. Um, so it was the one in 2003 and then not another one until th 2019. Yeah. Um, so that was a really big deal. Um, whether they're combined no hitters or not, whether it happened at U.S. Bank Stadium in front of eight people, it uh, doesn't matter. Those are still big moments. Uh, and it's really significant for the people involved. Um, so those are super cool. Uh, and those moments of history are not lost on me. Uh, the two football victories last year were a big deal as well. Um, I don't think I have felt as um, happy for others and sort of relieved internally, as I have calling that Kentucky game compared to almost anything. Mm -hmm. Being next to Norm Jordan when they won that thing was so great because of Norm. Like he has been through a lot with this program. Yeah. And he has seen both good and plenty of bad, as he and I have joked. Um, so to have that moment for him was great. And to see it for Clark and the players and everything. Uh, the insanity of the end of the Florida game last year was mm -hmm. that's hard to have in perspective mm -hmm. um, a clock that should have uh, kept running. And then it didn't. Mm -hmm. And then Anthony Richardson uh, has a free play basically and chucks it out of the end. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was karma. That was karma. Totally, but, totally, totally karma. Uh, but you, you know, speaking of Norman with his extensive history with the program and still being a record holder he knows the the history in the last 50 years as, as well as anyone and for him to still be involved in that level uh, I think is, is pretty cool perspective but the other thing I was going to point out was the emotional relief on coach Lee's face after the Kentucky game just raw emotion um, yeah. just spoke spoke volumes to to all of us former players yeah and it just shows his passion we were at the there were about 20 of us I mean I saw you in Hawaii there were about 20 of us at the Hawaii game and we could hear the celebration going on 
in the locker room. We were about 30 feet away and security would not let us get any closer. We wanted to be in that locker room celebrating with those guys just because of the yeah. passion and the history and the, the raw emotion that you get to see up close and personal in your, your position. Yeah, very fortunate in that regard. Uh, by the way, I don't know that I've met a smarter person, and I mean this almost down to a T, than Norman Jordan. He is painfully smart. Right? And, and, and if he knew that this was happening, and perhaps he'll see it, I hope he does. I hope at some point somebody forces him to see this uh, be, because he would recoil. But he's painfully intelligent. And um, having him around is a joy because I get smarter having Norm around. As much as he would say otherwise, I get smarter having Norm around. And, and, we, <laughs> and we've had so much fun in two years in that booth. Seriously. Like, I, I've, we, we've had some unbelievable uh, microphone is off laughter moments mm -hmm. that I wish I re could repeat, but we probably shouldn't. Um, <laughs> the, it's just, it's, I've been really lucky to work with great color analysts. And mm -hmm. one of them is Steve Berrios, a guy down at Tulane. Uh, but Norman is, um, man, I feel really fortunate to have that guy with us, um, in the booth, just because like you said, whether it's his perspective, whether it's his thoughts on the game, uh, whether it's just, you know, being a good person, despite the fact that he's from East Tennessee, uh, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's the best. I love it. I love that we dragged him out of Etowah and made him a Commodore. You know, he's, uh, they like to say he's dumb as a fox. <laughs> he'll, he'll, play, he'll play the role but don't ever sleep on norman yes sir um, i wanted to ask a little bit of your comparison i don't know if how fair this is but virginia tech is very different from a school from a sports perspective than vanderbilt and and tulane and i would think even vanderbilt and tulane are very different in that Tulane is, you know, they haven't been in the conference since 63 and they they do their own thing. Yeah, according to their fan base, they are certainly still in the Southeastern Conference and they are <laughs> not pleased about the departure from 60 years ago. Well, I was going to say most of those people are probably no longer with us, but uh, there's an, there's yeah. enough. There's yeah. enough. One of one of the most popular refrains working at Tulane mm -hmm. is and I'll not get it right, but Tulane has more Southeastern Conference championships than X number of current programs. So oh, they yeah. they love to repeat that. Yeah. And, and so does Georgia Tech to a certain extent as well. <laughs> but I wanted to get your perspective. I realize you may have had different job responsibilities at the three schools, but could you do a kind of a comparison or a contrast of the three different experiences or the fan bases or however it is you want to share that these three universities, while they may all be uh, power five schools, they're just very different in their approach to uh, athletics and, and the way that they they're made up. The most obvious statement that I could make is Vanderbilt is a lot more like Tulane than Virginia Tech. Um, I give Virginia Tech a lot of credit. Um, and I say this respectfully of the three schools that I've worked for, and now part of it is the size of the student body, mm -hmm. um, their community base is as good as it gets. Mm -hmm. um, they're really, really passionate. The sense of belonging that you get when you become a Hokie is really high. Mm -hmm. And some of it is the rural Virginia thing. Some of it is the shooting in 2007, to be candid with you. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's joined people at the heart in a way that's really difficult to do, absent a tragedy. Mm -hmm. um, and then some of it is just the flat out athletic success that they've had over the course of 20 years with Frank Beamer. It has declined, 100% it's declined. Uh, but it was really high for a while. And there was a really unique bond that Hokies had that sense of community is something that as much as I like our Vanderbilt community it it it's hard to replicate there's a lot of those like U.S. News and World Report type things that say like uh, the love of the school meter is really high at Virginia Tech and I believe it um before you get to Tulane yeah name, name a better song that enter the Sandman in Virginia Tech at football games. Is there a better entrance to, 
No, what's funny though, is I would tell you this. Um, I love it. And I wish we had something like that at Vanderbilt. And if I could snap my fingers and advance us 15 years and have something like that, I would do it. Um, I, being there for eight years, you start to get uncomfortable with the sense that you're just a football team with a really cool entrance and you don't actually win enough games to back it all up. Uh, and all you see on social media is here's enter salmon. Here's the walk through the tunnel. The students jump, the stadium jumps, they run out of the tunnel and then the game starts and you lose to Clemson by 30. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you start like, that's how I felt. I don't think everybody felt that way, but I, at the end of my eight years, I was like, we're sort of just a school with a really cool football entrance. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Um, anyway, but it was great. Like, don't get me wrong. I mean, Metallica recorded a video mm -hmm. and it came on and it's like the whole place goes nuts. Um, so there's an affinity for that. And you, I guess what you're saying is you got to have a program that backs up <laughs> the rest of the <laughs> that. I, I love it all. It's great. And then when you can do that and then go beat Nebraska in 2009 with Tyrod Taylor, which they did, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Or if you can go to the Sugar Bowl in 2011, that's great. The problem is when you do that and then lose by three or four scores to Duke, which I saw happen before. So, you know, whatever. Um, it's interesting. There's a lot of similarities with Tulane and Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. I don't know that they're perfect parallels, but there's a lot of them from the academic situations. Like I heard coaches at both schools talk about the academic challenges that they had uh, to getting guys into school. I actually think Tulane um, was a little bit more um, antagonistic than Vanderbilt was from an admission standpoint. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that's perfectly fair, but some stories that I heard down at Tulane was like, what are, what are they doing? It's like, it's like they almost wanted to reject the athlete just for the sake of it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, frankly, my experience is from the Vanderbilt side until Chancellor Gee from several years ago, and then now with Chancellor Deermeyer, that's always been the perspective uh, yeah. Yeah. I, and I don't, I don't have, all I know is Deermeyer. I know Deermeyer. I know Candace Lee mm -hmm. and um, I got no problem with high academic standards. Like that's fine. Um, I've got no problem with anything. It's just, you would want unity and synergy rowing in the same direction. Like we understand that this is who we are. This is our sense of self. And this is what we're going to strive for. I get the sense that Vanderbilt has a pretty good sense of self today. And perhaps there's less antagonistic yeah. discourse than there was perhaps 20 years ago. I, I don't know. I can't speak to that. Well, um, well that's what I was going to say is your perspective is fresh. You just having the last almost two years with the program and with the school, you don't have the 36 years of that I have and that many of us old heads have of such frustration that we couldn't recruit and couldn't bring in certain level or caliber of athlete because that's just the way it's always been. Yeah. And, 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 and I think you're getting a fresh perspective, which is great that us <laughs> I, I, guys don't I, I, have. No, I understand. I, no, I, I understand. And, you know, I didn't take the job because Vandy United was happening. <laughs> I, I look, you asked me you asked me prior if I had any Nashville connections. Um, mm -hmm. Some people may or may not know this. My wife is from here. So that's a that's a huge selling point yeah. from from here. She's from forty five minutes north right across the Tennessee Kentucky border. Mm -hmm. um, that's that was a huge selling point for me, mm -hmm. obviously, to raise our family yeah. near hers, huge. Um, so I was going to take the job if presented to me anyway. Mm -hmm. but, I'm sitting at Hawkins um, where I can look through those windows and the South, I can see it on your screen. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's not there anymore, man. <laughs> the South end zone is down. It's rubble. Yeah. Um, and I recognize, you know, 
I'll, I'll use his name. I'll use his name because I love him. I've gotten to know him a little bit in a year, but George Plaster flat out. I, yeah, I know. <laughs> and he's been on our show too. I love George. George is awesome. I love him. Uh, but like when I first met him, I'm like, yeah, they're doing this. They're doing that. And he's like, ah, they'll never do it. And I was like, George, I, I get why you feel that way. Yeah. But I know that every day that I go to work, I go through a construction zone. So I don't know what to tell you. Like the walkway to my office has changed multiple times mm -hmm. because I've got to work around construction vehicles. So I respect that there's a lot of hesitancy there. Andrew, uh, the, 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 the football alums, when we see those pictures coming through social media, that gets the most conversation started of any pictures, anything that's going on right now in the football world. Yeah. Because since 1981, that stadium, as you know, has been that stadium. I now, sure do. When I it was sure built in 1922, it was the showcase of the South, all that great stuff. <laughs> but crap, it, you know, everybody left us behind. And the fact that you saw the Palmer Fieldhouse come down in the we, north. We did a ceremony for Palmer, which needed to be yeah. bulldozed 50 years ago. Yeah. Respectfully, because it was filled with, I think, like asbestos was in it. There was some oh. issues, like there was for sure issues. <laughs> there were with... probably bodies in there too. But, but that's just to see progress. <laughs> I know. For the guys who played in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s, that's tremendous. Because we never thought, we, it used to be a... I'm going to call it an overwhelming pessimism. I, now so rounding. I call it, I call it scar. It's emotional scar tissue. Oh, it is. Is, so what, is, is what I've, what I've picked up on. And again, speaking of George, yeah. like George doesn't know anything about me, but every time I see George, he goes, ah, you said emotional scar tissue. That's good. I'm like, yeah, it is. And I, it, and by the way, I don't say true. that judgmentally. It is. It's, it's 40 or 30 or whatever it is, number okay. of years of hoping for X and getting Y. But now, from my perspective and all the alums I talk to quite often, it's a guarded optimism, which is a, a rounding the corner, in my opinion. It's still quite guarded, but there's a little bit of optimism thrown in there because more and more former players are starting to show up at practices and have now bought season tickets we have a group of about 50 or 60 season tickets together as a group. And that hasn't been done in many, many years. And these are guys who played in the seventies, eighties and nineties are all coming together. So I'm, we're loving it. We're absolutely loving it. I love it too. And um, you know, I'll say this and, and at the risk of being like pedantic or saying something really simplistic, we're mm -hmm. obviously not going to turn into Alabama or LSU or whatever with our thought process. We're not like, we're still going to be the Vanderbilt ethos and DNA. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I, I think I love Clark Lee. He is going to step front and center this season and tell everybody that the goal is the postseason. Okay. Now okay. Um, that's not some sort of revolutionary statement, but I think this is just, I'm not trying to put words in Clark's mouth. But I get the sense that he's really proud of what the program has done so far. But at the same time, I don't think he likes the way that mediocre results are celebrated. And I love that, right? He's saying five and seven is cool, but we're not here to be five and seven. No. I, I don't know what, you know, he got hot for calling it the best college football program in the country we all understand what he's talking about yeah. the ability to educate to elevate to achieve however that's i don't know what the number of wins that means yeah I, and and i don't even know that clark has a number of wins like that would be almost silly but i appreciate the fact that he's leaning into the idea that mediocre results four or five wins aren't worth being celebrated. That's not what he's here for. He is deeply passionate about winning games. And I, I love that. I, he's going to step out there and he's going to say that. He said that on our uh, radio show already. So I'm not speaking out of turn. Like the goal is to make a bowl this year. Now, what happens if you don't and all of that sort of stuff? I don't know. 
But again, it's about raising the bar psychologically for these guys to say, congratulations, you you won a couple of games, but like we're here to win all of our games. Yeah. You know, An Andrew, what's going on inside of, of McGugan has not been that way in, in a long, long time. There's a synergy. There is a, a, a message, a unified message. And the current kid who just, went into the portal aside, the fact that the coaching staff has largely stayed together for three years and the majority of the roster has stayed together in comparison to the other SEC programs speaks volumes for what Javon Hay and all of those guys on Coach Lee's staff are, are doing in there. And, and frankly, that, that's what gets us as alums fired up for where where we're headed yeah i i the thing that i would add is um i think it's obvious that we're going to stub our toe at some point right sure um and i mean that not from like a football program standpoint i mean it from just anything like there's a lot of people and i mean it from like an external standpoint from you know tickets marketing broadcasting whatever that see an opportunity to reach for a little bit more whatever it happens to be whatever more is we're going to stub our toe in that pursuit but there's a lot of people that i work with on a day-to-day -day basis um that have that desire to say vanderbilt can be a little bit better here um uh, not to thumb our nose at anything but here's some like we're doing a coach's caravan coming up right so um what is it it's atlanta chicago memphis and houston over the next couple of weeks yeah, that's something that yeah Birmingham on there i was a little disappointed but that's okay <laughs> you're 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 a you're a brisk two and a half hour drive uh yeah. <laughs> we'll get you up here um that's something that other programs have done that's not revolutionary and that's fine that it's not revolutionary, but we can step into spaces that we should be occupying. Mm -hmm. And we are, and we're not just seeding ground for the sake of it. Uh, it's an opportunity to get out there and see some of our alums in Chicago, Houston, Memphis, Atlanta, whatever, and talk about Vandy United. Like we're doing those at Truist in Atlanta, Wrigley in Chicago, um, a music hall of fame in Memphis, which is cool. And then Minute Maid Park in Houston. Like we're doing those in cool venues. Yeah. Candace is going to be at them. Clark Lee is going to be at them. Shea Rouse is going to be at them. Um, Anders Nelson, the volleyball coach is going to be at them. Like there is, there is a desired uh, energy to, again, step into spaces that Vanderbilt hasn't stepped into. And I think it's okay, frankly, that we step into spaces that other people occupy just because like somebody else does a coach's caravan. I mean, they do them at Nissan Stadium, like Tennessee's done it there. Old Miss has done it there. Who cares? We yeah. should be out there talking to our fans. And I think that's a small example. I think we're doing a lot of things like that, which are very, very good. Again, just kind of stepping into spaces that we should be and saying Vanderbilt can be equal to and be of, uh, beyond any one of our peers. Oh, absolutely. And, and if I'm a if I'm a ninth or 10th or 11th grade athlete, regardless of my sport, and I see what's going on at Vanderbilt with all of the athletics facilities and, and all of the, the good things that are going on. That would get me very excited if I'm one of those kids in high school and Vanderbilt's on my radar. My gosh. Clark, Clark's got a great line. And, it, and it's to an extent perhaps alludes to any sort of name image likeness thing mm -hmm. that has popped up. And it's not his. I think he took it from Jack Swarbrick who probably mm -hmm. took it from somebody else. Mm -hmm. But he's like, sometimes you get a real sense if a kid is shopping down your aisle. Yeah. And, you know, we had a couple of flips in the recruiting process last year. Mm -hmm. You know, perhaps the kid was never really shopping down our aisle. It's the only aisle he had initially. And then other aisles popped up and he really wanted to shop down the other aisle. Like you can't, mm -hmm. if somebody's not shopping down your aisle, then they're not shopping down your aisle. Yeah. Um, now we need to entice them that our aisle is the right aisle. I get that metaphorically speaking. Yeah. Um, but Norm would tell you, and I think probably Clark would, that there has been a clear 
definitive, without question, elevation of talent on the roster since Clark showed up. Oh, my gosh. So I was at that ETSU game. Yeah, so was and I. I. And, and I couldn't <laughs> have been more disappointed in what we saw. Yeah. But then fast forward to this past season and bodies are flying around. And the picture that I always refer to is in the Kentucky game. I don't know who took the photo. It may have been somebody on the Vanderbilt uh, photo, photo staff. I'm not wrong words, but there Medication is, staff, yeah. There is a photo of the Kentucky running back with eight defenders, Vanderbilt defenders, in on the group tackle. And that, to me, just is the example of the bodies flying around this past year that, frankly, athletically, wasn't there in the past. Yeah, and it's going to keep getting better. And, and I, you know, I, again, I'm not saying that we're going to all of a sudden have, you know, Will Anderson from Alabama playing for us. Again, you know, it, we're, we're no, nobody in here is delusional. Like we, you know, some schools are going to go get the number one overall recruit in the recruiting class and some schools aren't. But I, I you know, I get what Corbin has done with the baseball program. Um, but man, he became and still is an elite developer of talent. Mm -hmm. Elite. And everything that I have seen from the coaching staff so far on the football side is they are outrageously good at talent identification mm -hmm. and then progressing them. Jaden McGowan won SEC freshman of the week at least once. Mm -hmm. His other offers were Ivy Leagues. Mm -hmm. So we saw something and said we could make him into something. And we did. And I'm not saying you can just take a bunch of Ivy League recruits and all of a sudden win a national championship. I, you know, <laughs> we're, we're not, again, nobody is delusional here. Right. But the football staff is certainly proving itself through two plus years to be really good evaluators and developers of talent well it, it's in the 40 odd minutes that we've been talking and and for guys I, it's my fault for not reintroducing or resetting that i've got andrew allegretta who is the radio voice uh, for vanderbilt sports i don't I, is it is it going to be eventually or are you going to do softball not softball gosh forgive me volleyball or any who knows right um I, I maybe i don't know um so obviously we split the roles right when I got hired. So mm -hmm. Kevin Ingram does radio for men's hoops mm -hmm. and then SEC network plus for the baseball games. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I always, I do feel like sometimes it's worth like explaining how that works a little bit. Cause I know that's foggy. Um, I handle men's basketball and women's basketball for SEC network plus football, radio, baseball, radio, Kevin handles men's basketball, radio, football sideline and baseball sec network plus what sec network plus means is when espn effectively punts on a game and mm -hmm. says that it's not going to broadcast it on linear tv which means sec network right. no plus like on your cable package for those that still get that or it just makes it harder to find <laughs> right right it, you know um anyway so when ESPN punts, they basically tell the schools, whether it's Vanderbilt, Mississippi State, whoever, mm -hmm. um, you're in control of everything, right mm -hmm. from right to the people that run the cameras to the people that call the games. Mm -hmm. um, so when that is the case, which typically speaking is non-conference men's basketball games, mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, are, are all of the non-conference baseball games and a good chunk of like the lower level series. Like yeah. Kentucky, Kentucky's really good. I was not saying Kentucky's not good at baseball. I just mean from like a national profile standpoint, Kentucky isn't, you know. From whatever. a market standpoint, like a, a yeah. Yeah, market. yeah, 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 yeah. So like they picked up Arkansas and Vanderbilt at the end of the season to put on yeah. ESPN or put on the SEC Network Plus because that's a higher profile mm -hmm. series. Okay, whatever. Um, when it's on plus, it's us. And I will say, I know every now and then people like to jump into um, my inbox or whatever it is. Um, we're, we're genuinely speaking, we are asked to be 50-50 when we're on the network, mm -hmm. network plus. Mm -hmm. Because in theory, the other team's fans are there. So while we're employed by Vanderbilt, we are asked to be neutral 
in those moments. Mm -hmm. So we try to do that. Uh, I recognize and respect that other schools don't follow that decorum. <laughs> no, they do not. <laughs> but, but our decorum is our decorum. And we'll be as 50-50 in those moments as we can be because it's the right thing to do. And it's what we've been asked to do. Guys, let me on, give you a little pro tip. Yeah. Reset your TV to match what is coming through Andrew's voice on the and, app and you got I'll, a winner. I'll, I'll say this. I know it's... I I. If I, if I was in charge of like all things and I'm not for good reason, um, but I, I wish we could make it easier to sync those things. And I know there's some technology out there that can do it, but I don't, I don't run Learfield communications. So whatever. Yeah. Um, it's not easy. It would take money. And I'm not saying like you could just snap your fingers and it would happen. So I get, I get the impediments to it, but to me that that's an investment worth making. But anyway, um, for those of you that stream your TV, like if you are a YouTube TV subscriber, yeah. um, the, the app and YouTube TV are almost synced up anyway. Mm -hmm. So when I, when I will sync Kevin to a men's basketball game, it takes minimal effort. Yeah. Yeah. But here, here's where you also get in trouble, or at least I do when you're in a group text of all Vanderbilt fans and one guy is 20 or 30 seconds ahead of the group. That's a problem. <laughs> so here, so I don't know if you've been following this, and this is way out in left field. Yeah. But from a from an in the weeds thing, mm -hmm. with NFL going to YouTube TV for all of their mm -hmm. out of market games, mm -hmm. YouTube TV is like a sixty second delay from cable. So the concern is the concern is gambling at yeah. a at a professional level mm -hmm. because uh, making bets or placing. But I don't. I'm not a gambler. Generally yeah. speaking, I am genuinely not a gambler, but I was yeah. reading a few articles about how that 60 second delay is a major issue for people in Las Vegas. I can see that. I can certainly see that. Andrew, I could talk to you about sports and Vanderbilt particularly for the rest of the evening, but I know we both have things to do <laughs> and I want to be respectful of your, your time. Happy to do it. I can't thank you enough for, for hopping on conversations with Commodore, sharing a little bit of your, your brief, but very interesting involvement thus far at the right time and the right place to be on campus. So thank you for uh, joining me tonight. Hey, no, thank you. And, you know, um, it, it's been, it's been a true joy to be here. Um, this place is great. Uh, the people are great. Um, the opportunities presented by Vanderbilt are very, um, they're so engaging. Like we're at such a unique moment to be here and try things and do some new stuff. Um, the city has all of these potentials. Um, and regardless of like, you know, how we interconnect Vanderbilt with Nashville or all of that sort of stuff, whatever. Um, just, just being around the people uh, that I've been able to get to know yourself or Norm or Kevin or whatever the list goes on uh, has been a lot of fun. So um you know, I know the the easy, simplistic saying is that water finds a level. Uh, and for me personally, I definitely feel like water has found a level here in Nashville. So that's pretty special. Well, we need three wins against Kentucky this weekend. So I'm oh, don't we don't we I will I will say Knoxville last weekend was not fun. <laughs> no, those guys have not been fun the last couple of years, but it's a long season. Long season. You know, we just, I say we, the Vandy boys tend to get busy and hot at the right moment. Check the SEC uh, tournament in the years past. I was at that game when we were down by nine against Ole Miss, and I've never seen something like that before, Andrew. That was phenomenal. I'd love to create some of those coming up. We've got a We've got a team that I think can be pretty special. Um, I, I think this next weekend will be pretty significant for us. I think if we can shake off Knoxville, yeah. uh, do our thing against Kentucky, which is good. They're, they're a good program. They yeah. throw it. They got good arms um, for folks that watch or listen. They've got almost a hysterical number of sacrifice bunts. <laughs> um, they are almost, almost three times higher than the second place team in the sec in terms of total sacrifice bunts. It's, 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 it's almost, it's almost, con they, yeah. we talked to coach about it yesterday. Um, they just give up the out to get the runner at second and say, we can win this game five to one. Mm -hmm. 
that's their that's their philosophy. Uh, but if we if we shake it um, and get two out of three against Kentucky, I think our heads will get screwed on just fine, and I, I think our pitching staff will get a little bit healthy, and then we'll be we'll see where it takes us. Well, just keep that enthusiasm coming because we sure enjoy it. So thank you. Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Down.